I've chosen to speak for a few minutes about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This morning I would like to focus a little bit more on the fruit of the Spirit than on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, those of you that are maybe a little bit more new here and haven't been perhaps attending very frequently or very often uh, or for some years, but in the past while you might have heard us speak quite a bit about the need for the Holy Spirit and how important it is for the church to have the Holy Spirit. There is no replacement for the Holy Spirit. No education, no Bible school can give you what the Holy Spirit can give you. There is no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and we're not going to get tired of preaching about the need of the Holy Spirit. Because it's like the one man said one time, somebody came up to him, it was a man that preached repentance quite a bit. And, and let me just say that perhaps you have been one that has been here for quite a long time and you've heard us preach and preach and preach about the Holy Spirit and about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, whether it's baptism, outpouring, unction, anointing, I really don't care. I'm for all of it. It's kind of the same thing. You know, the Baptists say the Holy Spirit comes this way. The Mennonites say he comes this way. And the Pentecostals say it's this way. Well, however he comes, let him come. And it's time that we quit arguing about how he comes, but make sure he comes. And make sure he fills us. And make sure that we present a vessel that can be filled. And for, so, so for some of you that perhaps have heard us preach about the Holy Spirit for many years, and you're still sitting there and you haven't experienced the satisfaction of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, perhaps you should examine your experience of repentance. Because there's a wonderful covenant that God makes with his people, and it says this way, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, is God's word God's word or not? Because if God's word says something, it's true, whether you believe it or not. But this preacher that was preaching repentance so much, a lady came up to him and said, when are you going to quit preaching on repentance? And he says, when you are all finished repenting, or when you have all come to repentance, when you have all allowed the work of repentance to come into your life, and so, I want to put out a warning. There's a lot of preaching out there about the Holy Spirit that I absolutely disagree with. And furthermore, why do you listen to men and lift them so high and you have no idea who they are or how they live? YouTube is full of them. And I want to caution you. Don't just open your spirit to any, any preacher that has a good message. Because Jesus, the Bible says, he began to do and teach. And if I don't know if a man does what he teaches, I'm normally not one to quickly listen to him. A friend of mine, a pastor, invited a Bible teacher in or a deliverance preacher into his church. And he was very sad afterwards because he told me, I had no idea that he was a man that was divorced and remarried and his life was not lining up with what the scripture says. Listen, it is so important that first of all, the preacher is one that has lived this life himself. The Bible says that the husbandman must first be a partaker of the fruit. And if I have not partaken of the fruit, I should better not preach about it. In other words, what good does it say 
what good does it do to me to be a Bible teacher that preaches on a good marriage if I don't experience a good marriage myself? Wouldn't you say I'd be a hypocrite? Millions of people have flocked to men that were even married trying to give marriage counseling. So we don't listen to someone just because that he knows a lot in his intellectual mind. He's got it all figured out. But because he does what the Bible says, he has become the message. The Apostle Paul says it this way. You are our epistles. You are the letters that are written. The congregation, the church is the proof of the ministry of the men that preach to it and that minister to it. And listen, I want to speak to you mothers and fathers. The same principle is also true in your home. It will do you no good to teach those little children to share and to love each other and not to fight. If you're not living that example in front of them, you must be an example. You teach, first of all, by example. And so a truly anointed ministry is a ministry that first of all walks what he talks. And if we can't walk the talk, we'd better not talk the talk. It is so important that what I preach, that the Holy Spirit has made this real in my life, you can't give what you don't have. Look at Peter and John at the temple. The Bible says that they went to the temple to pray. There was this, there was this uh, lame man there at the temple gate. And I assume he was there for quite a few years. And the Bible says that Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. And this man and they... They looked, they saw him there, and he said, look on us. And the Bible says he looked at them expecting to receive something. And I'll tell you, he got a whole lot more than he expected to receive. But Peter and John said, silver and gold have we none, but what we have we give you. And they gave him by the power of the Holy Spirit, they gave him healing. It's because they had something to give. And so that's why it is so important that I am an example of the message that I preach. If I speak about a happy marriage, it's important that I model it. And mothers and fathers, the greatest gift of heritage that you can give to your children is not a bank account of a million dollars, but it is an example of a happy and a unified married life. And if it doesn't work at home, don't try to export it anywhere else. Let the gospel, first of all, get a hold of you. And that is why we all need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, the Holy Spirit brings both fruit and gifts. And the difference between fruit and gifts, fruit must be developed. It's something that you have to cultivate. You have to plant the tree, you have to nurture the tree, you have to fertilize the tree, you might have to prune the tree, but fruit is developed. In fact, let's just read what the Bible says about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit is proof that he's there. Do you hear me? The fruit will prove the presence of the Holy Spirit. An orange tree will always bring forth oranges. And an apple tree will always bring forth apples. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses uh, 23, I believe it is, 22... Let's read what the Bible says about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Apostle Paul speaks about all the works of the flesh or the evidence that the flesh is there in live and in full color. But then he says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things 
there is no law. It is so important that there is fruit developing in our lives. A person that says, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but has no proof of that fruit in his life. Love, the first one. Romans 5, 5 says that the love of God is poured forth into our life by the Holy Spirit. The God kind of love. You know, in the book of, or the Greeks, they had four different kinds of love they spoke about. The eros, which was the sexual love between a husband and a wife. Another one was the phileo love, which is more the friendship kind of love. And uh, Starge is another kind of love, which I believe is family love. I might get those two mixed up, Starge and phileo. I'm not sure which is which, but one is a, the love that you have for your family, your Freundschaft, your children. And the phileo love, I believe, is the friendship that I have with my brothers, friends. But the God kind of love is the agape love. And the reason so many marriages in this world topple so quickly is because it's not based on the agape, the God kind of love. And I'll tell you what, the other kinds of love are no foundation to have a happy marriage. And the agape kind of love, the one thing about the agape kind of love is there's times when you have to exercise your will to have that kind of love. Let me give you the best example. For God so loved the world that he chose to give his son, his only son. And you know, the world we're living in, young folks, listen, the danger of the world we're living in, the feel-good kind of love, that is not a solid love to build anything on. God's kind of love is the, the love that loves when it's difficult to love. Are any people in your life that are kind of difficult to love? Oh, all the time for me. Some customers. Not my wife. But yes, there's times when we have some disagreements. We're just human. We're, we're not flying over the top of uh, all the world and with wings or anything. We're still human. But I believe that God has given us the agape kind of love where those things are very short, conflicts are very short and very quickly resolved because you exercise the will of the Holy Spirit because God's kind of love has been poured out in our hearts and, and we've chosen to love with God's kind of love. And so I'm saying, if you're here and you profess, maybe, maybe you even speak in tongues. But if you can't speak in a nice tongue to your wife, it's deception. There's got to be a balance. You see, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is sometimes, one church says, well, we believe in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We don't need the gifts. Well, if you have the fruit but you have no gift, you're really not that useful in ministry. The gifts are given for ministry, but fruit is character and it's developed so that that ministry can work. If I have, the Bible says, if I have gift of prophecy, if I have faith that I can move mountains, but if I don't have character, <laughs> you didn't think I'd say that, did you? You thought I'd say love. Well, that is character. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. And I can have faith to move mountains. And that describes some of these miracle-working preachers that are on YouTube. And I want to warn you in Jesus' name. The Bible says we should know those who labor among us. Why do you eat at the table of someone you have no idea whether he lives in adultery or not? And time and time again, there have been men that have been lifted way, way up high 
and have been almost idolized and worshipped, and I believe that is probably one of the reasons why God allows them to fall, is because he says, I will not give my glory to another. Don't ever, don't you dare worship me or my co-ministers. You worship Jesus and Jesus only. Look beyond us. Take the good that we preach you, but don't worship us. Yes, the Bible says you need to honor and respect us. I don't preach those messages very often. But don't worship us. You don't ever worship a human being. You don't ever give the glory that belongs to Jesus alone to a human being. And the gifts that we have, they're gifts that God has given. But what is more important is the character and the grace and the life that we have. And ask God to develop that fruit of the Holy Spirit within you. I wonder if we would go into your spiritual orchard. If we could see with spiritual eyes. If I could walk into your heart. Or if we could just open our heart and see who we are. How does God look at us? Would he find the fruit of love? Would he find the fruit of joy? Would he find a man and a woman of peace? Would your church, where you attend if you're a visitor, or the church, this church that I attend, is it a place of peace and of joy? Is it a place of rest? Is it a place of safety? Is there men and women of character? Do the people love each other? Look at what Jesus said. You know, we get it twisted up sometimes. We call what is important not so important, and what really is important, we overlook. I'm speaking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that first fruit is love. You know, let me say it this way. I heard this described. Moses went up to the mountain, and he came down from the mountain with 12 comm- 10 commandments. Judaism has, I understand, 613 commandments. I wonder how you could keep track of them all. And Jesus has one commandment. You know which one? Let me show you. John 13. Go to John 13. A new commandment, verse 34. I give to you that you love one another. You might say, oh, that's easy. I love my brothers. But then he goes to describe the way he loved. We should love each other. Even as I have loved you. that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you know that this scripture right here gives the world the right to judge us? Let that sink in. Do you know that this scripture gives the world, not the Christian, the world, the right to judge us and say, they're not true disciples. They don't love each other. Or they really love each other. I've had men ask me if the church, if the people in our church uh, believe in none resistance I've, I've had them ask me if we believe in divorce and remarriage. And I've, asked, I've had them ask me if the sisters in our church wear coverings. But I've never once had anyone ask me, do the people in your church really love each other? The acid test of a disciple 
You know, at the very beginning of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the most fundamental, basic gift, or fruit, I'm sorry, is love. And for the agape kind of love to be in my heart and for me to demonstrate the agape kind of love, there has to be an exercise of my will. And there's times just like Jesus. In fact, let me just read the other one. It's also in John. I think it's in 15. John 15, where Jesus describes love in this way. Let's just read John 15, verse 10. There's a whole list of scriptures that speak about love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And then again in verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And there here describes it. Greater love has no one than this, than that a, one, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Wow. You know, when Jesus came from heaven, the greatest proof of his love was at the cross. It was not when he healed the people of their diseases. The day and age we're living in, there's so much made of the gift of healing and the gift of prophecy. And there's conferences will teach you how to prophesy foolishness. When you get the Holy Ghost, you need no teacher to teach you to prophesy. You will prophesy. All of that is a gimmick and a game. The Holy Ghost will make exactly out of you what he wants to make out of you. Do you think he needs help? The Holy Ghost need a counselor to teach him how to get people to prophesy. That is, I'm sorry, that is foolishness. But when a man is filled with the Holy Ghost, he will prophesy. And prophesy is not getting up and proclaiming the future. It is encouraging. It is strengthening. It is blessing people. Look at what the Bible says What about prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14. He that speaks in an unknown tongue, he edifies or builds himself up. But the one that prophesies, he edifies or he builds up the church. He strengthens the church. He encourages the church. He brings hope and life. If there's someone there that is discouraged, he brings encouragement. When there's somebody that's depressed, he brings life. And when somebody needs to repent, he exhorts them. But it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't go to some prophecy conference. Go to your closet. Ask him, first of all, to fill you chuck full with love, with joy, with peace, with the fruit. Let the fruit become more than nubbins. Let the Holy Ghost get a hold of you, and you will minister life. Get in your closet before the Lord and say, God, I want to speak peace and life to my children and my family. Let your, ch your family be your church. Let your family be your little disciples that you are discipling. Practical Christianity, first of all, has the fruit of the Holy Spirit growing. I mean, I was a boy in South America, and my father had papaya trees and mango trees and peach trees and apple trees and tangerines and oranges. We had all those fruit in the backyard. But the believer needs to have those fruit in the front yard, right here in the heart, to be full with grace and with character. Men that love when it's hard to love. Men that have joy when it's nothing to be joyful about. When it's not about the circumstances. Jesus' circumstances weren't good, but he was the greatest man full of joy. We're so used to have good things, and therefore we're happy. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit doesn't move just because the stock market went down. The fruit of the Holy Spirit continues to grow. 
And if you want to be a man and a woman that has the fruit of life in you, get into the Word of God. Get off of YouTube and get into the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Here some time ago, and I, I, I say again, I don't want to preach something I don't do, but here some time ago, I'd cut the cable TV because I was sick of what was on there, and then I deleted the Facebook app off of my phone because I was sick of what I was seeing on there, and now what I receive is more grace from God. It's affected me. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm saying if you want to know God and you want to have a word that ministers life, perhaps you need to cut that. Quit courting people's affection and attention and their admiration and start seeking for God's admiration in your life. I'm not making any rules. I'm just suggesting. <laughs> but you know, God wants us to be so full of abundant life and full of fruit. And Jesus said, this is the commandment that I give to you, love one another. And sometimes love gets you to do some very difficult things. Speak words of correction, words of rebuke, but always with love, because there's redemption in our hearts and in love. God wants fellowship with us, and that's why we tell you the truth. And you know where there's a church or a family where there's love? It's a wonderful place to be. There's harmony. There's peace. You can grow things. You can grow some things. It's like a garden. You can put a little fertilizer on there and it'll just flourish. Or let me describe it this way. You see these musicians that we're playing you know, one plays the piano, there's a guitar, and there's two more. Sometimes we have a violin. And they work in perfect symphony. And it ministers beautiful music to us. That's what it's like when the church is full of love. Not the gushy, mushy, yucky kind of love that, you know, you know, is... There's a kind of love that really makes me sick when people, and it's not love really, but the world would call it love. The flattery, you know, oh, brother, you're so wonderful. Oh. In Honduras, I remember one time a brother came to me and just, oh, just blessing me for the way I preached. The next line, he wanted to borrow my truck. <laughs> not that kind of love. What's in it for me, you know? See, God's love isn't selfish. It's not what's in it for me. Amen. Expect nothing. Lower your demands. I said to someone recently, there are no 10 steps to a happy marriage. Two steps. Very simple steps. Well, not simple. Basic steps. Die to self. Expect nothing. You'll be happy. Amen? I'd like to hear the daughters say Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, the church and the home can be such a wonderful place when the fruit of the Holy Spirit is there and it's growing. Now, maybe I'll admit to you that some of these graces that God has put in my life, they were very small nubbins in the beginning. And yes, some still need to grow especially when I meditate on patience. Patience. That's the one that needs to grow on my, in my life. I'll just be honest. I told my wife years ago when I married her, her dad was such a patient man. I said, man, if I ever become patient like your dad is, you'll know God did a work in me because by nature I am not like that. But he's working on me. And you can ask her, I give you total permission, she can tell you the truth. Because there's no sense playing games in this. Let's be real. You know, I said about the beauty of harmony and 
I, I had this yesterday morning at the prayer meeting, I shared this funny little thing that I saw on the Andy Griffith show where Barney thought that somebody in the chorus was off tune. Some of you have watched that. And so he said he would go and he would stand beside each singer in the chorus and find which one of them is off tune. Never realized he was the guy that was off tune. And sometimes we think the fellow that is out of tune, we think it's someone else. But it's a little closer. It's right here. So if I tune this instrument, this heart, and get so filled with the love of God, and then I add joy on top of that, Jesus said, the world didn't give it to you, the peace and the joy. The world can't take it away. This joy and this peace that I have, the world didn't give it, so the world can't take it. It's not based on circumstances, but it's based on the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You won't believe the times. There have been times where I've got messages that hit me like a ton of bricks just before I get up to preach. Not messages from my co pastors but circumstances come to my attention that bring heaviness to my heart and I bow my head and I say, Lord, there's no way I can preach in my own strength. I need you, Lord. I need you. Now, you're not maybe called to preach, but you're called to proclaim this gospel to the ones around you. Your life, brother, sister, yes, you sitting back there in the back row or in the middle row in the right and the left, I'm talking to you. You truck drivers, you uh, carpenters, businessmen, laborers, salesmen. I'm just looking out. Nurses. The gospel that the people around you are reading is not perhaps the Bible, but they will look at your life. That is why it is so important to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit and not to be so concerned about the gifts, but the fruit. I have heard the story here recently of a man that was an atheist and he did not believe in God, but he was working with a man that just was full of God's love. And he said, the life that that man lived convinced me that there is a God. And the man had never said a word to him. So, to wrap it up, let me say this. We need the fruit of the Holy Spirit because it's character. And it needs to be cultivated and it needs to grow. You need the, you need the word of God in prayer. You need to be a part of a church body. You need the discipline of a church body to grow. Some people don't grow spiritually because they're afraid to join themselves to a church body. That's why you're not growing. Give yourself to a church body. Lay your life down and become a servant in the church. Serve the people around you. Become a servant. Jeez, that's the kind of love Jesus had. He came with a towel. I should have a towel here and, and just hang it over my, my arm here and, and demonstrate that's what Jesus was. He was a man with a towel. He was humble. He was a man of grace and full of love. But we also need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and perhaps we'll speak more about that at some other time. But we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit than to minister to those around us and to fulfill the callings that God has given us. Amen.